to see all of you this morning. Please open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1. I want to start a series this morning on the ways of God, walking in the ways of God. I believe that the Lord is preparing us for an incredible season of His goodness, incredible season of His glory. And while we, my heart is excited for what the Lord is bringing and establishing a witness for us in the base and through our lives, also important for me that we, that, we, that we learn the ways of God, that we know how God w- walks and He wants us to walk, how God moves. You know, it's an amazing thing whenever in the, in the Bible story, whenever the Lord blessed the Israelites, that blessing eventually became a curse. It's quite something. He takes them out of slavery, makes them free men, and He takes them into the land of milk and honey, the land of overflowing with goodness. And that goodness, that blessing becomes a curse. Eventually they lose the promised land. They get sent into exile because they could not walk in the ways of God. It's interesting to see how how the psalmist speaks about that. In Psalm 103 it speaks of Moses. It says that the Israelites knew the acts of God, what God could do with his hands. But Moses knew God's ways. And so as we are expectant and excited to see what the Lord can do only with His hand, and we've got testimonies of His hands moving in our midst, we want to constantly be seeking His face, not His hand. And so the ways of God helps us to seek His face, to point us towards the one who is holy, to point us to the one who is jealous, to point us to the one that is God above all gods. And so in this next season, we're going to talk about walking in the ways of God. My heart is full of a lot of things. I'm going to try and align them this morning according to Psalm 1. So if you would mind just to read with me. I really appreciate that. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose life does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff, that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So Father, this morning I ask you to help us. Your word encourages us in Proverbs 4 to to sell everything, to, to purchase understanding. And this morning I ask that you will help us by your spirit for for wisdom and for understanding, so that we would not just only know your ways, but that we would walk in them. We thank you that your way is a way of righteousness. We just come this morning and we just honor you. We just thank you, Jesus, that you made it available for us. You made access to our Father in heaven available. I pray that you'll help us, especially this morning, as we set our hearts for understanding, as we set our hearts to know the ways of God and to walk in them. Would you help me, Holy Spirit? Would you come and anoint me afresh that I might serve your people while I thank you for your peace, Lord? I take authority over any form, the cause and the effect of distraction. I declare the blood of Jesus, the Lordship of Jesus over our hearts, over our minds, and over this meeting this morning that we can clearly hear what your word is saying and what your spirit is 
stirring in our hearts. Pray this in your mighty name, Lord. Amen. So this first psalm is a psalm that doesn't have an author. No one really knows who wrote it. But whoever this man or woman might have been, they understood that there's two primary ways in life. The one is the way of wickedness, and the other one is the way of righteousness. Now I want you to note there's only two ways. You might think there's three. You might think there's a, a middle ground. There's only two. You might think you can walk in the middle. Whenever you think you're walking in the middle, I want to warn you, alert signs. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out. There's only two ways. You're either walking in the way of righteousness, or if you're not, what's the alternative? You're walking in the way of wickedness. Now, it's interesting to see that it, it has got three different positions. If you read this, this Psalm 1, it says the first position is a seated position, just like you are sitting. So where you are seated is vitally important for which way you've set your heart on course. Then it says there's a certain way you stand. How you stand is determined by where you sit. And then it says there's a way of walking. Now what's interesting, the way of wickedness, I've got these three postures. Sit, stand, walk. The way of righteousness has the same three postures. Sitting, standing, walking. So let's look at the ways of God. How do we walk in His ways? Well, it starts off to say that blessed is the man. We'd love to be blessed this morning. So I know you are blessed already because you are in Christ. Amen? Who'd like the blessings of Christ to manifest in your life? Okay. You are far more hungry for the blessings of God. At 8 o'clock they were 50% convinced. It's like, Maybe. Listen to this. It says, whatever a man does who walks in the way of the Lord, whatever he does will prosper. Amen. I would love to prosper in the Lord. Now, for some of you that is concerned, Yanis hasn't become a prosperity preacher in the last six months. But you have to settle deep down inside of your heart that God wants to prosper you. He wants to bless you. Why? Why does he want to bless the base believers? Why does he want to bless the base? So that we can bless others. The prosperity gospel is bless me for me. Wrong. The way of righteousness saying, no, no, Lord, bless me so that I can be a blessing to others. If I'm not blessed, how can I bless? If I don't have, how can I give? And so it starts off by saying, listen, the way of the Lord is the way of prosperity. God wants to prosper His people. God wants to prosper you. That's why He sent Jesus in the first place. But how do you go after this way of prosperity? How do you, how do you get yourself to walk in this way of righteousness? It starts off in verse 1 to say, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He says your walking has to be aligned. Do not be double-minded. Do not say, no, I look to Jesus. He's my Savior, but I'm walking in the ways of the wicked. I will look at Him, but I will do my thing. He says, don't be confused. Do not think that you're going to get blessed that way. You might think, Hey, I've got fire insurance. One day I'll go to heaven. But I tell you what, you'll stumble into all sorts of things while you walk on the earth. He says, no, 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 be careful. You want to walk in the ways of God. You want to walk into prosperity. Careful to the counsel that is influencing your life. Be careful. The way of God is the way of prosperity. But the influences that comes to your life, it's vitally important. He describes wickedness or wicked men 
as those who are focused on violating the standards of the law. So let's just think through that statement. What was the law all about? It's all about love. Love God, love others, love yourself. And so this writer is warning you and me, watch out for the influence of those who's constantly trying to violate love. Watch out for the influence of people that violates the reality of loving God, of loving others, and loving yourself. Watch out for those influences. Don't have them. You want to walk in the way of righteousness. You want to walk in the way of God. Be careful for the influences that you allow in your life. So the way of wickedness have got all the influences of the world. Happiness. The world is the the biggest influence in the way of wickedness. Who's the biggest influence in the way of righteousness, you suppose? The Holy Spirit and the truth of God's Word. Can you see the contrast? You can be born again... Right with God, but you can allow the influences of the world to lead you in the way of wickedness. Not even realizing it. But if you're born again, you're made right with God and you allow the word of God and the influence of the spirit to be your sole influence. Guess what? You're starting to walk in the way of prosperity. And so this speaks about the reality of the influence of the Holy Spirit. If we're going to walk in the ways of God, we're going to have to learn how to walk with the Spirit in love. God is a God of love. How do you know that God the Father loves you? He sent His one and only Son. How do you know that Jesus loves you? He was willing to give Himself dying on a cross. How do you know that the Spirit loves you? came to make His dwelling inside of your body. And so if we're going to walk in the ways of God, if we're going to walk in the way of prosperity, we need to walk under the influence of the Holy Spirit and not the influence of the world. So let's test that this morning to track which way you are heading down. Who's the biggest influence in your life right now? Netflix? Netflix? YouTube, Rapport, News 24, your bank manager, your mother-in-law, if she loves Jesus, you better allow her to influence you. She doesn't. Who's your influence? It has to be Jesus Christ, the truth of His Word through the Holy Spirit. The moment we allow the Spirit to influence us, guys, we're walking, we're starting our journey of walking in the Holy Spirit. Walking in the way of righteousness, walking in the way of prosperity. It's an amazing thing that Matthew 5 says this, Blessed are the meek. What is the blessing that comes to the meek? Blessed are the meek. What is the blessing that will come to them? What's the promise? They will inherit the earth. Wow. Whatever you think of prosperity is too small. God says, if you walk with my spirit, if you walk with a meek heart, if you allow the spirit to influence your heart, I'm planning to get you to inherit the earth. I don't know about you, but that's big. The world says, no, 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 come, let me influence you. I'll give you the world. God says, no, that's too small. I'll give you the whole earth. I'll give you an inheritance. What is the requirement? The meekness of your heart. Can I say meekness is not weakness? Big difference. Weakness is yani yammer. I can say yammer like all awesome. Of sunny seer. No, no, no. Meekness is when you can say, Holy Spirit, my heart belongs to Jesus. Bring your influence. And the moment you sense the Spirit say or 
urge you in anything, you take that step and say, I just want to do this, Lord. You see, the way of God is all about your heart. It's all about the meekness and the influence you allow the Holy Spirit to have in your heart. At the moment your heart is set in meekness, you're starting on the way of God walking into prosperity. And then he says, in verse 1, well, let, me, let me say this, walking with the Spirit. Let me just pause a little bit. So how do we walk with the Holy Spirit? It's like, it's like this room. Just for a moment, let's consider everyone that's sitting in the middle eye. You are in the middle row. You are in the way of God. Is it okay? Not in His way. You're walking in His way. You're seated in His way. Happiness? This guy's outside. I'm sorry. This morning, you're outside of the way of God. You're in the way of either unrighteousness and this side, you're also outside. You're in the way of self-righteousness. You okay with that? Just for this morning. The guy's in the middle. You're in the sweet spot. You, you got it. Well done. Pat yourself on the chest. Made a great decision this morning. You're sitting in the ways of God. So how do we walk with the Holy Spirit? Do you see this aisle down here? Can you for a moment picture a fence that's erected? So for the guys that self-righteous, sorry, you're outside this fence. On the other side, in this aisle, I want you to picture another fence that's erected. So the, the middle group are sitting fenced in. They're sitting fenced in. They cannot move themselves out of the way of God. They're sitting in the, in the way of God. How do you walk with the Holy Spirit? Can I demonstrate to you? You start to walk with the Holy Spirit. You're walking saying, Lord, I want to walk in the ways of God. I want to walk in the way of prosperity. I want to stay in the middle lane. And then you start to drift a little bit. And you hit this fence. Well, ek vandaan kom met ons doordingdrade gespan. It shocks you when you hit that fence. And then you say, oh, that's not nice. I want to get back. And then you start to, to walk again, but then you drift off. And then you hit this fence on the other boundary. It's like, oh, whoa, whoa, that's too much. Walking with the Spirit is like that. The one boundary the Spirit sets up is love. He says, I want you to learn to walk in love. The moment you walk out of love, I'm going to let you know. Because you're grieving me. If you're not in love. It's a guideline. The love of God, the Spirit of God pushes us back to learn to love God, to love others, and to love myself. And then I get this love thing going, and I start to drift, and I hit this boundary. This electric fence is called quenching the Spirit. What does it look like? It's when you think you can do things with your effort and your ability. And when you hit this fence, the Spirit says, the fire is gone, the passion is gone. What's happened to your passion? What's happened to your fire? And you realize, oh my goodness, Lord, sorry, I'm trying to walk in your ways with my effort. The Spirit says, yes, you're right. You walk as I guide you. And these two boundaries will keep you very safe in walking into the ways of God. So what's the encouragement? Do not grieve the Spirit. Stay in love. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not put out His fire. Don't do it with your ability. That's why speaking in tongues is so vitally important for you. When you that crazy language, you're making sure you're moving from this fence of self into the center of Him. How does He lead me? When I pray in tongues, I access His mind. When I pray in tongues, I access His power. When I pray in tongues... I access His Word. Now He's keeping me nicely balanced, walking down this highway of holiness. If you're not speaking in tongues, my friends, you're doing yourself a great disservice because you're constantly leaning against this barbed wire, thinking, why is it so difficult to serve God? Why is it so difficult to walk in His ways? Your passion for Jesus gets, the flame starts to go smaller and smaller and smaller. Then verse 1 says to us that the ways of God is a way of posture. It's 
not just a way of prosperity, it's a way of posture. It's the posture of your heart that determines whether you walk in his ways. Now please hear me. Jesus, through the posture of his heart, gave you access to heaven. Happiness? The posture of your hearts is what reveals how much access heaven has to you. Jesus in his sacrifice gave you access to God, but the posture of your heart determines how much access does God have to you, through you, for his purposes. Listen to how he puts it in verse 1. He says, do not stand. Blessed is the man who does not stand in the way of a sinner, in the way of sinners. What is a sinner? If you had to give me a definition of sin, let's go to the self-righteous bunch. What's the definition of sin in the Bible? How do you know what sin is? Anyone decide? Say again. Rejects God. When you reject God, powerful. Powerful. If you ask Adam and Eve what the definition for sin is, you'll discover that sin is whenever you have an opinion that's more important than God's word. What does God say to Adam? He says, Adam, you can have all the trees, but there's one tree that you don't touch, the tree of knowledge. Don't eat from that tree. So what does Eve say? As a... Uh, let's just see. So she goes and she eats from the tree of knowledge, and that way choosing herself to be the source of her life, Saying, I don't need God that much. I don't know I, what I think, what I want. My opinion is far more important than God's instruction. So when the psalmist say, don't stand in the ways of sinners, he's warning you and me to not stand with a posture of pride before God. Do not stand in a place where you figure your opinion is more important than obeying God. Do not stand in the place where you're reasoning. God says this way. You say, no, 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 no. Let's just talk about that. I think this way is better. God says, no, this way is not. Uh -uh. See, friends, if we want to walk in the ways of God, it requires a posture from our hearts, a posture of humility. A posture saying, Lord, if you don't lead me, I don't know where to go. If you don't help me, I don't know which way to step. My heart needs you, and whatever you say, Lord, whatever you say, you will get. I'm not going to negotiate with you. You see, somehow we think that because I'm going to go to heaven, I can negotiate with God. You don't. You obey God. His word says it. His word doesn't suggest it. We're going to look in the series. We're going to look at the life of David. We're going to look at the life of Paul. We're going to look at the life of Moses. You know when people got into trouble? It's when they started taking God's instructions as suggestions. Ma, yeah, I don't think that way. I think I must go this way. Is it? You'll end up like Eve. God's way is a way of the posture of our heart, friends. Now, it's one thing if you're trying to figure out God's word. That's one thing. But if you know God's word and you're not acting on it, you're standing in the path of sinners because your heart is full of pride. You know what the Bible says happens to the proud? God says he opposes them. But to the humble, you will extend grace. Which side of the fence do you want to be on? Which road do you want to walk on? And so this walking with God requires a posture to walk with a posture that is humbly obedient. One of my favorite leaders told me the story. He said to me, one morning he's getting up to, pre to, pre to preach in the church he was leading. And as he got up to the pulpit, he puts his 
material out, he felt the voice of the Lord speak to him. And the Lord asked him, would you stand on your head if I ask you to, instead of preach? He said to the Lord, Lord, if I am convinced that this is you speaking, I will do it. He says, in that moment, he heard the voice of the angel sing, we found one, we found one, we found one. Friends, what will your life look like if you stop resisting God and just start submitting, just start yielding to Him? What do you think your life will look like? Let's test that this morning. What's the last thing that God has said for you to do? Have you done it? I'm not rebuking, I'm just asking a question. Let that be the indicator of where your heart is. Are you still reasoning with God from 1940? Let's see if we can get this. You're the Wachkreiper Kampe, and you're still hiding from God. You're reasoning with Him. He says, just do this. It's like, no, let's just see if we can hide from God and reason this thing out. Or are you quick to say, Lord, you said it. I'm just going to humbly obey. It doesn't make any sense, Lord doesn't make any sense, Lord. What I see, what I perceive, what my body is telling me, what my senses are telling me, it makes no sense. I'm just going to do it. Because you said. I remember one Sunday morning, a guy came up for ministry. It's in the early days when it was still the Vusanand, not the West Rand. The Lord said to me, this man is coming up for ministry. I want you to punch him on his sternum, on his chest. Hit him. Like, hey, Lord. Next big report, the pastor that hit from the pulpit. So I did. Remember that man was standing here? We still had the blue carpets if you were part of the new day or that transition. It was the blue carpets here. The Lord said to me, smack him as hard as you can on his chest. You know what my default setting was like? Hey, Lord, what are the people going to think? What about the chairs? The Lord says, well, you want to see what I can do? It's up to you. So what do you think I did? I stepped back. I got him to close his eyes. He didn't see it coming. I stepped back and I smacked him on the chest. I think he flew six rows back. As I hit him, his eyes starts flopping backwards. And as he hit the floor, he was shaking under the power of God. The next day, I phone this guy and say, man, tell me what the heck's happening in your life. Why are, what are you up to that the Lord is asking me to do something as crazy as that? He says, no, I'm sorry. You know, it's been this long thing. The Lord has been speaking to me about this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. And I, I've been reasoning with him. And yesterday when you smacked me, the Lord said to me, now it's done. Never saw him again at church. Now you can question the method. It's like, oh, is that how you lay hands on people? I've learned something at church this morning. You can question the method all you want. All I know this is my conscience is clear because I heard him say, do this. Jesus healing a blind man. <laughs> Spit. How? No time for reason he had to obey. Friends, we want to see the goodness of God. We want to see the power of God. But we've got this reasoning mindset, this prideful heart saying, no, let me just reason that. doesn't feel comfortable. The way of God is a way of passion. It's a way of passion. Listen to verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man who does not sit in the seat of mockers. Who knows what it feels like to be mocked? Anyone? There's a couple. I know what it feels like to be mocked. I grew up 
very, can't, can't say disformed because I wasn't. I wasn't disformed. I was just, what's the right word for lump in English? Clumsy. I had a big mother, a big father, big bone. I eat millipup. But when the time I hit school, age seven, I wore a size seven shoe. You will not believe it. Every year with my birthday, I had to get a new set of shoes. Because from the age of seven, my feet grew one size every year. Luckily, it stopped age 15. Every time I blow a birthday cake, I get the new box of shoes because the old ones are too small. So you look like a clown because your body is not in posture yet. Yet every day you go to school, people say, ah, ha, 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 ha. Look at your funny shoes. Look at your funny feet. I remember one day getting so cross, I nearly smacked a guy out. Luckily, he just sidestepped me and I nearly cracked the wall because of this mockery. He says, the people that sit in the seat of mockers will never walk in the ways of God. But blessed are you. Blessed are you if you don't sit in the seat of mockers. So what does it mean to be a mocker? It means you use words to cause pain or to judge people. But here's the reality. The mouth only speaks what the heart is full of. So what is this verse describing? It is describing the reality of people that in their hearts... They don't like God, they don't love God, they don't want God, and they use their mouths to simply express what is really in their heart. And we can say, cease those mockers, they are vile. They intentionally go after using their words to portray what's in their heart. But let's apply this to us this morning. Do you know that you can be born again, blood washed, but that the passion of your heart can get compromised by the world? You know that? You can be blood washed by Jesus, accepted in heaven, but the way you position your heart, the passions of your heart will determine what comes out of your mouth. So let me ask you this morning, how do you know what your passion is? Very simple. What is coming out of your mouth? What do you talk about when you stand next to a fire with your mates, relaxing? What do you talk about? The economy? The spring box? The cricket? The soccer? Or do you speak about Jesus and about how awesome He is to you? You see, what is in your heart comes out of your mouth. If you are passionate about Jesus, you cannot stop talking about Him. I think I told the story before. One day they invited me as a guest speaker to a rugby festival. Now, I don't know if you know rugby festivals that much, but some rugby festivals or most of them is really just an excuse to drink. And so they set up this whole evening with entertainment. Massive marquee, the, the beer is on tap, and the guys are joyful and happy. And they've organized a comedian for the night so that they can really stir the party. But they made one mistake. They invited me with a little slot to speak before the comedian could come up. So what do you think I spoke about? I spoke about what was on my heart. I spoke about the reality of how awesome Jesus is. He saved me. He rescued me. I was blind, but now I see. And here's the presence of His Spirit as a reality. I killed the environment for the comedian. They never invited me back to that festival ever again. But here's the point. What's the point? The point is this. What are you passionate about? 
Who are you passionate about? Because whatever you're passionate about, it'll come out of your mouth. It's an indicator for where your passion levels are. Can I say, my friends, if you never talk to anyone about Jesus, I want to question whether Jesus really is the passion of your heart. If you're one of those sleeper Christians, you know, Sunday, I'm in the church, but the rest of the week, I'm undercover. No one would know that I love Jesus. This one says, careful. You think you're on the ways of God, you're busy walking in the way of wickedness. Careful. The way of passion, the way of God is a way of passion. And when you find your passion, your words starts making impact. You start to use your words with impact. Do you know that you can change atmospheres because of the passion on your heart and the praise of Jesus on your lips? You can, pr- you can change the environment of your office. You can change the environment of your family. You can, in- you can change the inheritance of your children by simply passionately speaking the words that will make impact in their lives. What's the benefits of walking in the ways of God? Would you like to know more benefits? Firstly, it says that the Lord will watch over you. Verse 6. It's an amazing thing. You, you're walking. You hit this boundary. Oh, no, 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 no. I need to get back here. Oh, okay, yeah. It says the Lord will watch over you. The Lord will watch over you. I am who I am will watch over you. I will be what I will be when you need me to be it will watch over you. Wow. The covenantal God, the creative provider, the one that can create out of nothing, He's the one that will watch over you. As you walk on your way and you need His provision, He can create it if it doesn't exist already. Who wants to walk in the ways of God? the benefit of walking in the ways of God is you get planted like a tree. Now there's a drinking song. Those that's going to laugh now, I'm going to know that we share a similar sort of background. Gharki is a chomi. Gharki is a chomi. Gharki cannot be moved. He's like a tree planted by the water. Gharki cannot be moved. You know that song, guys? Concern if the girls knows the song. It's a drinking game. It's a drinking song. They're trying to proclaim a truth, but they live it out as hypocrites. What this Bible verse says, when you walk in the ways of God, you get planted like a tree. You get established in the life of God. The life of God is flowing through you. It produces fruit through you. It affects the way you bring healing to others. That's what it looks like when you plant it in the way of righteousness. You bear fruit every season. People look at you and say, Yona, last week, last year, the season was small. The fruit was small. Look at the size of the fruit this season. You want to measure whether you're walking in the ways of God. Let's measure the fruit of your life. Some of you have got fruit like prunes. Rusankis. Others of you like watermelon is like, oh my goodness, how, how's your life so fruitful? You know why? Because you've learned to be planted in the life of God. It says the leaves does not wither. When it talks about leaves in the Bible, it speaks about healing that will flow from your life. Healing for the nations. 
your life will be so fruitful. You will produce fruit and your life will be used. When people bump up against you, their lives get healed. Their marriages get fixed. Their finances get sorted out. Their relationship starts to work. Their bodies get healed. Who wants to walk on the ways of God? Then I love how it says this, the benefit of walking in the ways of God. It's what happens in verse 5. It's what, it's what happens when it says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. There's a certain standing you get. You get to stand in the assembly of the righteous. Now when it says the assembly of the righteous, it's not referring to us assembling as the righteous of the church. It's not what it speaks about. It speaks about the reality, all the translators speaks of this reality of a divine counsel. The fact that you've got spiritual authority, the fact that you are seated in heavenly places with Christ, the fact that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that you belong to the church of the firstborn. What's the biggest benefit you get when you walk in the ways of God? You can stand in the assembly of the righteous. It means there's spiritual realities you can access. There's legislation realities you can access. There's things that you can govern from being seated with Christ in heavenly places that can affect the earth. There's insight you get. There's revelation you get. There's authority you get. So that from the heavenly places you can sit in God's counsel and you can start to bring change to the world around you. When you stand in that assembly, there's no accusation that can come against you because you're walking in the way of righteousness. Amen? Love to pray this morning. to pray this morning for those people that saying oh my goodness I have to have some heart surgery done this morning the posture of my heart the passion of my heart The purposes of God within my heart. It's become clouded. I want to pray this morning for those of us that's recognizing, my goodness, the influence of the world is far stronger than the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might be born again for a long time, but you've not allowed the Holy Spirit to be the primary influence of your heart. If that's you, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. If you want to change that this morning, you want to recognize the influence of the world has been the loudest voice. This morning I'm coming, I'm standing because I want the Holy Spirit to be the loudest voice in my heart. I'm going to pray secondly for those of us who have a posture that reasons with God, that finds themselves prideful. doesn't matter what the Lord says, you always have an opinion. If that's you, I want to ask you to stand. It might be difficult if you battle with it because by standing up, it means you will have to humble yourself. You'll have to recognize where you're at. And then I want to pray lastly for those of us who, who find that their passion for Jesus has been subtly shifted towards a passion for the things of the world. Whatever it might be. So if that is you in any one of those three categories, I'd love for you just to stand. Just to quickly stand. If you, you need to respond to him this morning. You want to be in, easily influenced. You want your posture to be one of humble obedience. And you want
You want Him to be the greatest passion of your life. Awesome. 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 I want to ask if you're comfortable that way for those who are standing. I'd love for a team of leaders to lay hands on you and to pray the prayer of agreement with you. So where you're standing, would you mind just to Make your way to the front. We'd love to lay hands on you. We'd love to pray a prayer of agreement with you. We'd love to see you this morning standing in the streams of living water, the activity of the Holy Spirit, the life of God just flowing in you, through you. any of us this morning that's never been born again you've never said Jesus I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior this morning I'm coming to my right I'm coming to confess I need you that's you just raise your hand real quick awesome awesome before we ask the elders and the deacons to come and pray guys and girls I want you to pray very simple prayer. The first prayer is a prayer of confession. What does it mean to confess? It means you agree with what the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart this morning. The Holy Spirit says this thing is wrong or that thing is wrong. Bring it before the Lord. You say, Lord, it's true. I bring that thing before the Lord and I ask the blood of Jesus to wash me clean, to purify me. It's the first prayer you're going to pray. The second prayer you're going to pray is the prayer, prayer of repentance. What is repentance about? It's just about changing the way you think changing the way you walk, changing the way you do. So confession deals with the sin, deals with the unrighteousness. We can invite the blood of Jesus to wash the unrighteousness away. The repentance deals with you trying to do things in your effort instead of allowing the Holy Spirit in to come and help. Fair trade, isn't it? Divine exchange. I want to ask you just where you close your eyes. And start to confess whatever the Holy Spirit lays on your heart. Agree with Him. Say, Lord, it's true. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me clean. It's just you and the Lord. It's not, it's not for anyone's attention. It's just you and the Lord. And then... Once you feel that the things the Spirit has laid on your heart has been dealt with, just, then just repent. Say, Lord, I choose to change the way I think about you. I bring my rebellion to you, my pride to you. I, I repent. I choose to turn the other way today. Elders and deacons, would you mind just to come and lay hands on God's people as the Lord leads you? And minister to them. Jared, will you help us, please? Awesome. While they're ministering, would you mind to stand with me? I know those lazy boys get awfully uncomfortable. Just while we're standing this morning, I want to remind you, friends, that the Bible says God sees our hearts. He knows where your heart is at this morning. Some of you, you should be standing in front, but it's just too far. It's just the bridge too far. It's fine. The Lord says this, if you will open your heart to Him, you'll open your heart to Him. He'll come and help you. And so for us that's standing, can we, can we respond this way? Can we raise our hands to heaven this, even, or this morning? All we're doing is we, we're living out our yieldedness to Him. We're saying, Lord, we're coming and we choose to surrender to You. We want to walk in Your ways. I want to walk in your ways. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just where you're standing this morning. The Bible says this, that God so loves you that He sent His only Son, that Jesus so loved you that He sent His Holy Spirit to come and dwell within your body. With your hands raised, you're yielding your body to the Holy Spirit. 
Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit. You don't need our permission, but we want to make clear our utterance and our dependency and our, le- our, our yearning for you. Would you come and touch our lives, Lord? That's it. There's the presence of the Holy Spirit. Some of you will sense Him in your hands. I want to encourage you, wherever you sense the presence of the Holy Spirit in your body, recognize Him. Recognize the Holy Spirit. Say, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're touching my hands. Would you increase on me? You'll become aware that even your forearms are starting to to burn. You are holy, Lord. You are holy, Lord. We bless you. Bless you. Whose hands are on fire? Awesome. Just keep it up. Just more, Lord. Just receive the glory of the Lord on your, on your whole body, not just your hands. Just open your heart. Keep your heart open to Him. Put your attention, your mind on Jesus. Keep your heart open to the Holy Spirit. Jesus, thank you for healing, Lord. Thank you for reassigning. Thank you for repositioning. Thank you for a fresh commission that's happening this morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I believe this morning the Lord is refreshing. He's blowing. He's blowing on the fires of our hearts. There's certain calls in ministry He's placed on lives. This morning He's blowing on those calls again. There's certain calls in business He's blowing on those coals again. He's stirring a fire in you again for the purposes of God. Oh, we yield to you this morning, Holy Spirit. We want to serve the purposes of God. We bless you this morning, Holy Spirit. Sickness have no place in our bodies because our bodies belong to the Holy Spirit. Oh, we bless you this morning. Let's worship Jesus, friends. If you're comfortable to keep your hands raised, just recognize Him, enjoy Him. Let Him minister, let Him speak.